the talk really centers on complexity because uh, while we tend to reductionism, complexity is really where things are at. We have a tendency to reduce things to nil and they're empty. But complexity is really the name of the game if you uh, look at uh, psychedelic research, when it's reductionist, it's boring uh, and empty, and when it's truly complicated as it is, it's uh, fulsome. So I started, but uh, I'm calling this a dance, but I'm uh, unfortunately dancing alone a bit, uh, as a flamenco of uh, exploration and demystification that I hope will open the door to mysticalation. So I, I begin, the title of this, story, of this talk is The Varieties of Ketamine Experience. And I owe that title, of course, to William James, who was an extremely complex and interesting human being. So William James, in his rational self, he had tremendously irrational selves. Uh, he was into seances, and he had terrible grief, and he tried to contact the dead, and he was flim-flammed. He was an amazing human. Uh, so in his rational self, he said, the truth of an idea is not a stagnant property inherent in it. Truth happens to an idea. It becomes true. It is made true by events. Its verity is in fact an event, a process, the process namely of its verifying itself, its verification. Its validation, its validity is the process of its validation. Well, I think that's true in the era he was writing to some extent, but it's also true for invalidation. And what James did really not pay attention to, nor could he, was the buttressed delusion of validation because of the stamp of approval of an idea from an authority, from special interests, especially interested in obtaining a truth. So, we look at complexity. Let me get to my presentation here so I can work from here. Pardon me for, because I'm gonna, I can't use the slide. Okay, I, I think we're in shape. So my argument about complexity is that the mind remains irreducible despite the scientific creativity of a saying its mechanisms in parts. Though science succeeds in providing us with information about brain with its ever greater sophistication of technology and tools for exploration, the study of the mind itself remains locked in our subjectivity and our reports of our experience. In part, this is the result of the complexity of brain itself and in far greater measure because subjectivity by its nature is not knowable by instrumental means. So we'll be discussing mind and reporting about states of mind and their contents. This is an amazing view for what you can see of a travel through the cortex of a mouse brain. And it's, I'm gonna let it speak for itself. The green is the axons. We're going deeper and deeper into the cortex of a mouse. The other colors are glial cells and the cells that surround nerve tissue. You can see on the left where you are in the cortex coming down towards the white matter, that little box. It usually says on, on the screen what layer it is, I can't tell you exactly. <laughs> Yeah, 
It's like a universe. It's like a cosmos, like galaxies. It's like being in the realm of, uh, of the great cosmos. And this is a mouse brain. So imagine as we do this, the inside of your own cortex, the complexity of your own brain, complexity of your friends' brains. You're bigger than a mouse. This is from Stanford. Okay. Uh, and we're, we're using me now, or do you want to go back to you? How about if we go back to you, you'll have the full slide. Unless I can get it, let me try. And we can do the lights. Okay, so we're going to do you. So uh, Dick, complexity, which I'm trying to highlight here, and we're going to have time issues for sure because we have a long way to go. Complexity dictates a few caveats. Um, they're worth remembering, such as never trust a single neurotransmitter theory as explanatory. None have ever worked out. All attributions of complex mental phenomena have been irreducible thus far to biochemistry, scanning, neuroanatomy, and our various attempts at instrumentalism. Distrust the latest type for an internal love substance. They come every few years or months. Now, the current one's oxytocin, but forget about serotonin. It's more complex. The current real one now is glutamate, which we're going to talk about today. It's a, it's a brain substance. It's not the whole answer. So we remain at the level of observing interactions between drug setting and set in the broadest sense. That's where we are. That's what subjectivity is about. We haven't really gone past it. So embrace complexity and uh, inactivism, which is a, a Varela-inspired theory of being in the world, which I urge you to look at. And uh, avoid reducing mind to brain itself. And on a much lever, lesser level, uh, never trust an investigator who is single-mindedly making a reputation and livelihood on a single substance. Remember our friend Ricarte, who brought us terror of ecstasy, which fortunately isn't true. People still live in that terror. Okay. So, next one. <laughs> My setup is harder to read than yours. Um, so recently there's been a great resurgence of interest in ketamine. We're going to go through some of this much faster. And um, it's now touted as a significant new antidepressant with a novel mechanism of action. And there are a bunch of congeners in drug company development based on these studies. Ketamine was first synthesized in 62 and by 65 was noted to have psych psychedelic properties. Uh, John Lilly, who we met in 1985 and was a wreck and inspired people to avoid ketamine, 
was uh, by far the most potent explicator of uh, ketamine, and his book, uh, The Scientist, is really worth reading. It's novel. It's interesting. Charney, who's one of the NIMH founding uh, fathers of ketamine research, published in 1994 in the archives. And what Charney did uh, was to actually, at that point, though he later suppressed it, as we'll see, Charney uh, talked about the psychomimetic perceptual cognitive and neuroendocrine responses, in other words, that there was psychedelic uh, activity even at the low dose that uh, he and others uh, purported to use and did use in research. So uh, in the later papers, as you read them, uh, there's been a tendency to m diminish the psycho psychotomimetic experiences of subjects. That is to say, the attempt is to make uh, ketamine a docile little creature, which most of us know it's not, but of course that's dose-related. Um, he uh, refers to, uh, in 2010, to minimal positive uh, psychotic symptoms, which refer to hallucinations, delusions, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's, again, part of an understatement of uh, what ketamine's about. Again, sorry for my little technical struggles here. Um, so uh, all of this leaves uh, us in... Um, and the reason for really being here, uh, they postulated a low-dose schema of 0 0.5 milligrams intravenous per kilogram, which people uh, have been taking. Their last review was 163 subjects in all uh, over time. And, of course, that left the riddle of what are people experiencing? What are they getting out of this? Why is it an antidepressant? Why is it called that? So if I get to the next one. Uh, next one, please. So, um, this is marvelously difficult. Uh, so, uh, that's the emotional origin of this study. Um, add to that, uh, I had a talk of James Fadiman yesterday. And uh, James was giving wonderful first-person analyses. And uh, I realized how flattened I had become reading journal article after journal article in which there was no human reportage. Uh, so you read all this literature, and I went through dozens and dozens of paper, there's papers. There's nothing about what happens to people. And that was where we were coming from. The intellectual origin is somewhat different, uh, having known non-abusing ketamine, ketamine transformationists, people who go for the transformational effect over many years of use. My sense is that ketamine use has played a valuable and indeed transformative role in their lives. But there have been episodes of significant and sometimes sustained depression despite ketamine's use. And as a clinician, my interest in exploring what happened to people in this uh, uh, IV, and IV uh, ketamine series uh, was related to, well, is it a tool? Can I use it? Can I bring it to my patients? Do I want to do that? So uh, in my view, coming into the study, because I think it's good to do biases, what, what I'm really thinking about, what I'm as a uh, practitioner I'm looking at, uh, I think it's a transformative egolytic interruption from obsession and despair. Uh, ketamine has a more lasting and valuable impact than the, uh, just the antidepressant thing. So we did a study, and it's qualitative research. It's not a double blind. It's not an attempt to uh, definitively uh, outline what ketamine does. And we did it with seven people who were experienced greater than five uh, experiences of uh, moderate dose ketamine. Next. Uh, next, please. And the procedure was a straightforward uh, replication of the NIMH protocol, 50 milligrams, I'm sorry, point, 0 0.5 milligrams IV uh, uh, administered over 40 minutes. And um, our findings are, uh, are as follows. Let's go to the next one. Um, so... Uh, I want to share mostly 
uh, the comments of people because that's what we were looking for. Um, and that's in the descriptive comments section. So there was, a, as usual, pulse rate uh, was stable, but blood pressure increased, uh, as it does with ketamine. Uh, there was no suppression of respiration. It's very safe there. So um, let me just find where I can read it. So the descriptive comments during the experience included metallic taste, a 2 plus 4 on the Shulgin scale after Sasha, very pleasant, definitely K, warm, no hallucinations, paper baggy, crinkly, could read or make phone calls, floating, not particularly psychological, no spice, detached, no loss of intellectual fu function, shouldn't drive but could, relaxed, very gentle, not particularly insightful, could walk with support, couldn't drive, very tuned into all sounds, Mild plus minus, high, rather keep eyes closed, a bit anesthetized, door almost open, anesthetic is predominant. This is not an antidepressant. And of all the people in the study, only one person, there's an error in the, I think, next slide, please. Um, of all the people in this study, one person who came into it in a somewhat uh, grief-ridden depressed state, had a bit of a transformative experience. Interestingly, she was the biggest person in the study group and received 50 milligrams. So um, that, I think, is a, an important factor. And, and you see my conclusions here that body weight and effect are not linear, linearly correlated but related. Humans have a range of sensitivities irrespective of their actual state and hence only a correlation with peripheral levels of drug concentration. I think that's one to bear in mind for any kind of uh, substance, that our responses are not uniform. Milligrams per kilogram doesn't mean a hell of a lot. It puts you in a range, but it doesn't mean you're high or low. So the conclusion of that is the more I do, the more intoxicated I get, but one human's point of intoxication is another human's neutrality or another human's big high. Uh, a 50 milligram IV dose has a significant anesthetic impact irrespective of body weight. And uh, the depth of the experiences in the study related to the depth of the anesthesia, that is the reduction in access to sensation through external senses. I'm going to have the next one, please. So uh, the greater the dissociative effect, the more interesting uh, the experience. Uh, take out the transformative element and subjects are unable to understand the effect or value of the experience, save as it might relate to naive subjects to a partial break from the usual, uh, distract, uh, usual afflicted mind. So in consensus, the group recommendation was for threshold transformative, transformative work, and that really means IM 40 to 50 milligrams. We'll go on. So next slide. So in all of this, I want to think with you about what is the nature of a dissociative anesthetic. And my view is that with increasing dosage, much like with nitrous oxide, not just with ketamine, the sensory uh, 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 inputs and perceptual integrations are turned off at the cortical level, leaving consciousness more and more subject to its own view, experience, and creativity. And uh, the next slide, we got the whole thing, good. The next slide is an extraction I made from the Abhidharma Kosha. The Abhidharma Kosha is the third basket in the Tripitaka of Buddhism, the philosophical basket. It's, it's later than the first two, and it's very c comprehensive. And what it offers is a, a view of perception in the six paths. And when you look at it, where you can start to think about well, where is ketamine really acting? So we know kind of from experience that the first place it begins to act is visually and tactically. It's an anesthetic. It produces analgesia. You don't want to keep your eyes open. We know very little about uh, its effect on uh, taste and smell. But as we, uh, and we know that um, auditory perception is pretty well kept since we listen to music, we like music. It's altered, but it's there as the anesthetic 
level rises. And then we have mind more and more isolated on an, unto itself as per the preceding slide. And what we're looking at, I think, is both the stimulation effect of ketamine, but also that it uh, provides a narrowing of our sensory apparatus so we're more and more alike in a dream state. It's like going to sleep. Well, your senses are a bit alive, perhaps even more than ketamine, depending on dosage. But what is produced is the mind-only uh, function without much sensory input. And that's, I think, how dissociative anesthetics work. They cut us off from our perception and the integration of that perception. Next, please. So now I wanted to look with you at uh, dosages. So there are many routes. You can eat it. You can smoke it. Well, you can insufflate it. You can uh, do IM. And uh, this is from Arrowwood. And uh, just one comment, the IM dose uh, is a bit low in Arrowwood. It's really the anesthetic dose is 6.5 to 13 milligrams per kilogram. So this gives you range. And then for anesthesia, it's 1 to 4.5 milligrams per kilogram, but that's administered over 60 seconds, so it's a bolus. It's not uh, about doing ketamine by an IV drip over time. Is, is the message for me? No. Okay. Um, so then there's a review of the literature. We're not going to have much time to do it. Uh, next slide, please. The review of the literature is fairly comprehensive. What it shows is uh, kind of transformative experiences, uh, in the beginning especially. Krupitsky's work is transformative. Uh, he's still around doing good work. And he did it in Russia in a three-month-long inpatient setting using high dose. He even had a comparator of 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, which did very little. And he got, with all of that, very successful results of heroin and alcohol abstinence which was not totally reproduced in the United States in his association with Culp. Next, please. So uh, there's a very interesting study which goes to the nature of how you might administer ketamine. This is in uh, very treatment-resistant anorectics who were given uh, 10 hours of ketamine IV in uh, multiple, multiple sessions. Nine respond in up to five sessions, and six don't respond, and the outlier has 17 sessions. So that can you imagine you're basically on ketamine for 10 hours, you know, frequently. Well, you sort of get over not wanting to eat over time, at least nine people of 15. And then we have uh, a bunch of studies labeled as antidepressant ketamine research, and that shows us uh, very short-acting uh, results in numerous subjects up to seven days in treatment-resistant depression people. Next slide, please. And uh, three days in the bipolar one and two study uh, that Zarate did. Um, and Zarate is one of the main people. Uh, and uh, what you see is very short-acting results. Not everyone responds. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, so this is what's inspired uh, the work. Uh, I, I think we missed a slide which had the quote from science, but the, the quote from science was uh, in uh, late October 2012 that ketamine was the uh, first, uh, was the breakthrough uh, of antidepressant research for the uh, first time in 50 years. I'm arguing that's not true. Okay, then I just wanted to show you a tool. Next slide, that one, the next one. And the next one, this uh, and the next one. This is the major evaluative tool that Zarate has been using. It's called the uh, MADRS, and uh, it's the Montgomery Asperg Depression, whatever I forget scale. And um, it's about asking the same question over and over again. I wanted to dis demystify myself because. I thought, okay, rigorous tools being used. But this is a questionnaire administered by people at various intervals who uh, then ask the same questions. And it's like saying, how do you feel? In 10 compartments, how do you feel? My mother used to ask me that, how do you feel? Okay, and I'd answer in one of those 10 compartments, usually not suicidal ideation. So, once she got angry with me. So, uh, you know, this is 
qualitative research or quantitative research. When you really look at how people put things together, it's totally dependent on subjectivity. It's just me reporting on the same questions to you about what people answered in those questions. That's not very deep. Next. So recent developments are interesting. They're moving towards repetition of ketamine sessions. There's always been a comparison with ketamine and ECT because it's intravenous in this way. And so ECT is episodic. And relapse rates for ECT and ketamine are similar after first dose. Uh, so in this study, an ECT-resistant woman got to a maintenance phase where she's getting IV ketamine every three weeks. That's pretty novel and tense. Um, but what's happening really is that people aren't able to extend the benefit of ketamine as an antidepressant. They've looked at drugs for it, haven't been able to find one, and they're looking at multiple sessions. Um, so it's becoming like that. Next, please. Okay. So I, uh, <laughs> let me get back to my side. <laughs> So we're trying to look at, uh, we may skip uh, this one. So uh, what I'm basically saying is there's a, a method to the madness and it serves uh, institutional psychiatry. And really when you look at depression, it's extremely complicated. Uh, and it's extremely complicated in both in its drug treatment and how we treat depression or there are so many ways to treat depression. It's not simple and straightforward, and there are many recoveries without uh, psychotherapy or medication. Most uh, depressions stop without psychiatrists and therapy, and some depressions start with psychiatrists and psychotherapists. And there's a continuum between anxiety and uh, depression, and mostly they are mingled. If you look at the list of, of issues, when we really evaluate a person, they're extensive. I won't repeat them all. Next, please. That's Dura's melancholia, 499 years ago. Pretty complicated. Uh, and then uh, let's go to the view, path, and fruit again from Buddhism. So we've looked at uh, the uh, view, and we've done the path of research quickly, and now we're at the fruit. Uh, so what do I think? The effects of ketamine are related to dose and subject sensitivity. In general, the higher the dose, no matter what the route of administration, the greater the anesthesia and interference with sensory modes, the greater the internal stimulation and isolation of consciousness to mind only. The so-called antidepressant effect is short-lived and has only been extended by repeated administration of IV infusions. The rapid action of ketamine is due to its disruption of ordinary consciousness and its anesthetic properties. The mechanism of action as an antidepressant has not been elucidated inasmuch as the complexity of the state of depression is enormous and so are the brain chemistries involved, etc. Uh, there have been other mechanisms proposed than the glutamatergic mechanism, which is so high and, and present, and even Zarate is having trouble making that one stick. Next, please. So if we look theoretically, and I hope you're interested in this, at how antidepressants are uh, are administered in the substance sense, we can see that th there are different modalities. So one is the, di the disruption of consciousness, and that's famous with ECT and now, uh, and the sleep studies and narcoanalysis. And if you look, a second one is this mild disruption of consciousness with the IV protocol of ketamine, then the disruption, egolysis, and transformation towards the K-hole or in the K-hole, and other psychedelics, ketamine is not unique in every aspect. Then there's the direct shifting of mood and new experience of affect, such as in pathogens, you know, because they can be great antidepressants. That's what we were doing before it was made illegal, um, amongst other things, helping couples who were anxious, depressed, helping all kinds of people. Then there's the slow shifting of affective and anxious obsessional states. I call that the continuous brain bath. And that's antidepressants like SSRIs. And then we have things like marijuana, which in some people have the uh, effect of smoothing, refocusing, and obsession release. We're almost done. Next. So, conclusions. Um, so I don't think much of the IV administration route, as you can tell. 
Uh, I think it results in a mild disruption of consciousness. Okay. Uh, I believe this, we, you know, you have the slide. And that's why transformation is, I believe that in essence the IV uh, route was chosen because of the illegality of substances, the war on drugs, and NIMH researchers concerned to keep it uh, without psychotomimetic effects. And the lower the dose, the happier they are, but I don't think the effects are robust or lasting. Um, and that's why transformation remains the attractive way to, uh, to really use ketamine. That if you really think of psychiatric use of ketamine, it's to help people change personality, grow uh, in a fairly safe way, and pushes you towards the IM route. Next one, please. And I think, uh, I think the IM route uh, is the way to go and will be the way to go. People are going to do it much more because the IV route pushes you to hospitals, institutions, and while it's uh, good for business because you've got to do repeat after repeat, you know, it's awkward and people aren't going to really want to do it. So uh, can you get the whole slide in or not? Nope. Okay, back. Anyway, um, so my argument in conclusion is that ketamine is a valuable substance for transformation. It has risks, bad trips, you know, some small risk of uh, uh, addiction, um, but otherwise is a safe and widely used anesthetic, and we should value it and use it for transformational work. See where the whole thing goes with antidepressant work, but I think it's dubious. And then uh, last slide. If you're interested, these are things I have at the back of the room, my book, and I have some papers if you want to distribute, and I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties, but thanks for putting up with it. Good.